Um, the, the third value shift that we, that we got really interested in was coined by Maura McCarthy, and she's the co-founder of Blue Homes, and she called it the badge of awesomeness, which I think is just a great phrase. But the badge of awesomeness is all about this shifting American dream from needing to have lots of stuff to define who you are to moving into wanting to really have your freedom, have your nimbleness, your adaptability, and your control. And so this thrift is really an operating sort of element in here. Thrift doesn't mean you're cheap, cheap necessarily. Thrift actually means that you're more free and you're more unencumbered. So we'll talk a little bit about Mora for a second. Really interesting company, Blue Homes. So Blue Homes basically um, defied the downward trend in housing during the crisis by creating um, prefab homes. These things are awesome though. You know, prefab has a bit of a stigma. These things are beautiful. They've been in Duel Magazine. But they have a very unique hinge-based design, so they fold up like an origami, almost. And they're shipped on rail, or they're shipped in um, trucks. And all you have to do is have a plot of land, and you need to have you know, your hookup for your water, and your electricity, or your gas, and you're ready to go. But the really cool thing about them is they're like an anti-McMansion. Because rather than get overextended on a mortgage, they're modular. So you get a raise, put on a room. Have a kid, put on a room. But the, there's a really interesting badge in this whole thing as they talk about it, which is sort of a Harley Davidson like freedom and sort of self reliance that sort of operates at the, at the core of what these guys are all about. Another thing that happened um, you know, during the crisis was there were lots of ingenious new ways to think about going back to the basics of giving fair value to your customer. This is Russ Stanley, and he's head of ticket operations at San Francisco Giants. They had a, um, a business problem, which is during the crisis, Major League Baseball was already really expensive for most families. But on top of that, you know, the crisis had really hit people. So they came up with a really old concept that was respun into dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing basically is built on the belief that not all games are created equal. So a price of a ticket should vary based on demand and based on all kinds of interesting analytics. So what they do is they vary their prices on pitcher matchups, team records, and even the weather. And when Russ talked to us, he said, it's a really old-fashioned concept. He said it actually went back to the days in the Colosseum with the Romans, where you basically created um, ticket prices based on the quality of the lion. <laughs> Some of the examples here, um, you know, in the data that supported it is that people are li living this more nimble life. You know, the total population and spend shifter saying that since the recession, I realize how many possessions I have does not have as much to do with how happy I am. We heard this over and over again as we traveled. You know, we spent time in, in um, Kansas City with a group of laid off dads that were basically networking on Tuesdays at a Home Depot. They got together and they realized that none of them knew each other in the neighborhood and they resurrected the old fashioned block party, right? So I mean, there were just these really small little things that I thought were really interesting as we kind of went around the country. Since the recession, I realize I'm happier with a more simpler, down-to-earth lifestyle. Again, this sort of streamlining, focusing on what you really want. A couple of other examples in this sort of liquid life that we are talking about, this badge of awesomeness, is how can you be a, a brand that uh, allows the customer to make, um, not have to make a commitment um, right overnight. So example for that is um, Warbly. Has anybody used Warbly? Warbly is kind of a cool company. It's a cross between Netflix and Lens Crafters. And they have a really great consumer insight, which is that none of us like to go into the um, optometrist or into the glasses store and try on glasses. It's really, it really feels weird, right? You know, does my nose look too big? I don't know if these look good. I hate to look at myself in the mirror. Other people are watching. So what they've done is they've created a really simple system, which is that you can upload a photo of yourself on their website, and you can virtually try on hundreds of pairs of glasses. The next step beyond that, though, is that they'll send them to you in a packet, a sample one, and you can try them on in, you know, in your PJs and decide if these are the ones you really want to commit to. So again, this sort of variable commitment, I thought was an interesting idea. We talked a little bit about this barter economy. There's lots of interesting businesses um, popping up to allow people to not get weighed down. Um, you know, who remembers their $75 Calculus 700 textbook that they had for one semester, and they you know, stared at it for you know, the next 15 years in their basement? So, you know, bookrenters.com solves that problem. Also, the fact that we're living this more nimble life, you know. The Times reported that 25% of all U.S. households now don't have a landline. 50% of all millennials don't have a landline. Um, and then we even had some experiments. Um, we met some people as you travel the country that were actually getting rid of their costs, their overhead. 
You know, overhead's a, a terrible thing in a crisis, and in fact, people are actually adjusting their behaviors and trying to be really clever, for example, using Hulu instead of cable. This other thing was this shift from consumption to production is that we also realized that we have assets that are laying there that we could actually create new value for. So whip car out of the UK or relay rides up in Boston are two new startups that are basically allowing you to take your car, rent it out by the hour, by the day, by the week, by the month. You can even, they'll come to your house or they'll come to your office and you can rent your car while you're not working. Again, interesting ways to use your assets and to be more clever all amplified by these different social networks and technologies. Airbnb is another one. In fact, their CEO is on a um, world tour where he's basically staying in someone else's um, you know, house for the entire year and loaning out his house. Um, neighbor goods, do you really need that table saw in your, in your garage? Why not just borrow it? Go into a network and basically borrow tools and share them throughout the community. And then uh, this was from up at, at MIT. Um, it was an experiment on, on vigilance, fiscal vigilance, and they created a variety of different measures to realize when you were becoming overextended. And this is one of the submissions from one of the students, which was a Venus flytrap wallet that basically at a certain level it just shuts. <laughs> <laughs> the fourth of the five values we're going to talk about is block party capitalism. And we thought this was a really interesting uh, trend, and we anchored this trend in Brooklyn where we spent a lot of time really understanding the success of these local Brooklyn mar uh, merchants. You, know, you had big heavy hitters that were emerging like Etsy and Brooklyn Industries, but we also talked to pickle guys and we talked to butchers and we talked to lots of really interesting brands that were actually thriving sort of during the crisis. Um, a couple of other examples, and I was talking to Kevin about this before, is we spent time with Lynn Jurich. She's the co-founder of Sunrun. And she's I think, has a really interesting <coughs> business model, which is, Solar panels are expensive. They're cost prohibitive for most people. What they do is they actually um, defer the cost. So the upfront investment is basically charged back. You basically generate electricity to pay off these solar panels over time. You can even take the solar panels and you can put them on as an asset to your house and sell them to a future, to a future person. But again, it's a financial sort of solving uh, to a crisis. And, one of the things that was interesting about them as we talked is that they were literally going neighborhood by neighborhood and creating this sort of affinity for people to be able to afford them. Another thing up in uh, Massachusetts was um, this rise of local currencies. So we spent time um, understanding the phenomenon of Berkshires. Have you heard of Berkshires? It's in the Berkshire Mountains and it's their own local currency. They created it before the crisis and it was basically in response to helping local merchants survived the onslaught of all the national chains that were coming into the western Massachusetts uh, mountainside. But what happened though is that in the way Berkshires work is it's 95 cents on the dollar and they're basically traded between local customers and local merchants. What they didn't realize is that when the crisis hit there was no way for these local businesses to get access to credit. And basically this town kept itself together in Great Barrington by using the Berkshires and finding ways to sort of create exchange of credit and keep commerce going keeping the local merchants in business. And then um, we spent some time also in Massachusetts uh, with a Brooklyn-based company called Recycle Bank. Has anybody heard of Recycle Bank? Yeah. It's very cool, right? So John Norton is a semi-retired uh, recycling um, engineer or overseas recycling um, in Everett, Massachusetts. And he had a business problem, which is that nobody was recycling. And his recycling rates were really low. He went to a seminar, he saw, met Rob, and he started to, to get really excited about Recycle Bank. The way it works is that there's a simple RFID chip that's inside your recycling bin. It weighs your recyclables, it kicks that information to your online account, and you get what amounts to frequent flyer miles for recycling. So what's interesting about it is it's kind of like a hat trick business model because in John's case, recycling costs went down while recycling use went up. Recycle Bank then is creating this amazing customer community that they are then merchandising to a lot of different manufacturers and brands that want to have access to this really interesting customer database. So, you know, some of those other local things that we saw in those trends, you know, people saying I'm willing to pay a premium for products and services from companies that contribute to my <coughs> local community. This was a theme over and over everywhere we went from Tampa to Dallas to Detroit, wanting to keep our tax dollars local, wanting to reinforce support of our local merchants. And I just think it's interesting to note that brand preferences you know, have been declining in our study over the last decade to the point where they're nearing almost equality between I need 
brand names versus I'd be open to looking at more local, more private brands. <coughs> so a couple of examples of this locality sort of at, at play. Um, this is a storefront in, in, ur of Urban Outfitters as many national brands try to blend into their local environments. This is an Urban Outfitters trying to look like a, a bodega on the Lower East Side. Um, another interesting, I thought this is in San Francisco, is just this local idea that there's supply and demand pricing that we should set for parking meters. Again, a local solution. A uh, very local solution is um, Elaine Baton. He's the writer in residence for British Airways. Does anybody remember that movie, The Terminal, where Tom Hanks wandered around? That's what this guy's done for the last year. And um, he basically was there as sort of a, a cultural anthropologist slash ethnographer to really understand the intimate experience of people when they travel. And one of the really interesting byproducts he got out, out of it is he was you know, at the airport during the Icelandic volcano and got some really great stories. And I hear he's writing a book. Um, Undercover Boss, anybody read that or watch that show? Did you know that five of those um, companies that were featured last year, their stocks went up for two or three days after the shows aired? I just thought it was interesting. I'm not saying it's a hedge fund trading strategy, but this is <laughs> definitely a movement of foot for consumers not wanting to be marketed to, but to want to really understand things. And um, I spent time and I interviewed John um, Borthwick from Betaworks, who's got some very interesting technology. He has Bitly, he's got Chartbeat and TweetDeck. And one of the things he said to me was, talking about this transparency issue, is that he thinks that consumers with companies, they want to see your struggles. They want to see how you make decisions. Even if they're not the right decision, they want to know how you went about your thinking. So this sort of CSR 2.0, moving past sort of corporate reputation as sort of window dressing into something that becomes the core of the company and the culture, I think is a really interesting trend. You ever notice how CSR is always followed by the word initiative? which sounds like someone else's job, right? To make us look good. That's changing and you're starting to see these types of new mediums explore and allow people to talk in new ways. Um, sometimes it's just great, great customer service and great insight into a segmentation. This is a, a Belgian banking product that's called Private Banking by Shoebox. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Every month they send you this shoebox. You take all your stuff, your expense accounts, your, your, all your junk that you can't do if you're not a good financial manager and they sort it out for you. <laughs> Um, and then I guess I just think it's interesting about what's online and what's offline in a world where Farmville is coming to 7-Eleven. You know, I mean, so there's these interesting sort of, the, you know, dichotomies that are emerging that I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more about today as we kind of get into the day.